Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Cheers. Okay. Did you hear anything that I said before? Yeah, most of it. We just missed the little last part. Okay. Of it. So no sorry. Worries. Okay. Well, anyway, good to be here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll um, I'll share my screen if I can. Okay. Yeah. And now we can see. Thank you very much. All good. All right, well, yeah, again, thanks for the invite. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically give you a, a rundown of um, general state of New Zealand fisheries. So I'm going to call upon some published data um, up to about 2015. So it's relatively um, recent. So it was good that you had uh, first talk from Matt. I, I feel like a little bit of a um, an outsider to this group. I don't actually work in fisheries. I work predominantly in aquaculture, but um, I do teach on the fisheries and aquaculture course, so I do have an interest in in the state of stocks and and general um, fisheries management. So, so um, great that you had um, Matt to sort of tell you the the inner workings of the the overall process. So, I, at some point some, uh, that Matt was talking about, I'm going to sort of um, outline in a, a little bit more detail. And and yeah, anyway, let's get it underway. So if we sort of step back in time, um, generally a long time ago, late 1800s, it was generally thought that, uh, that world fish stocks were, were inexhaustible uh, in the, the inaugural address by Professor Huxley to the fisheries exhibition. He, he basically made this statement. Um, and clearly we've come, if we move forward sort of a, a, over a hundred years, um, the general state of world fisheries is thought to be in a in a completely different state. Uh, around about the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a, a proliferation of high profile papers that were really painting a completely different picture of inexhaustibility. Um, generally, a lot of the trends um, outlined in a lot of these papers were showing doom and gloom, food webs being fished down, um, uh, it's sort of predatory fish communities being fished down by about 80% within 15 years and collapse number of taxa sort of being extrapolated out and, and, and an estimate of complete sort of collapse of every single species within our oceans by the year 2048. So this all sort of um, um, kind of hit the, the media at around about sort of um, late 90, 1990s, early 2000s and and it I guess it's sort of a lot of these papers were scrutinized um, there was a lot of controversy around them a lot of picking apart the data to say well these trends aren't necessarily true um, but generally it was um, it hit the media and and generally served a good function because it kind of came into our social conscience and and a lot of sort of government regulations a lot of change came about um, around about this time um, and so i guess the the picture that i'm going to paint is that um things have been depleted but generally that um that um, we've kind of turned a corner and and things are not as bad as what a lot of these papers would actually um suggest so the general um, state of world fisheries, as sort of mentioned by, as, as specified by the FAO organization, their latest publication is basically suggesting um, that around about 70% of world fish stocks are maximally sustainably fished. And, and these trends have changed over time. We've generally seen um, few overfish stocks in the 1970s. But this is the area of worry that we're seeing um, overfishing taking place. And, and we, we know very little about the state. We worry about the state of a lot of stocks within certain realms of the, the world, particularly sort of within, within Asia, um, off the coast of Africa. Um, there's a big worry of uh, heavy overfishing there. But by and large, actually, interestingly, um, in previous reports by the FAO, they actually listed this particular block here as being maximally fished, which the press jumped on as, as meaning that it was basically an overfish section and that um, this section here was, was underfished and was, was, was basically um, in good state. 
the FAO in, in 2018 within their publication actually sort of very carefully reiterated actually what this means is maximally sustainably, sustainably fished. These stocks are not actually overfished. The overfished section is actually this orange section. So overall, um, you know, there are some very, very big worry areas with these overfished stocks, but generally about 70% is considered to be maximally sustainably fished. So what, is, what does that actually mean? Um, within this talk, what I'll spend quite a bit of time on is actually to explain maximum sustainable yield and, and show how New Zealand ranks against, against that. Um, so what I'm going to do is draw upon uh, uh, what we call a multi-species maximum sustainable yield model from a, a very prominent paper um, published in 2009 within Science um, Journal by Worm and Boris um, Worm and a, a whole host of others. And this was actually quite a, um, a key paper in that it brought to get, together a um, previously diverging opinions. There was Boris Worm, there was Ray Hilborn that had fought it out for years. And they actually came together with this paper titled Rebuilding um, Global Fisheries and, and kind of provided the first um, extensive assessment of, of what the state of our world stocks are in. Um, so I'm going to show you this sort of multi-species maximum sustainable yield model of these guys, but I'm going to actually sort of refer to data from a more recent paper by Ray Hilborn, amongst others, um, from 2020, that basically looks at fish stocks, the state of fish stocks from 1975 to 2015. So it's relatively, um, relatively recent. Okay, so... When I talk about multi-species maximum sustainable yield um, models, and particularly in the context of New Zealand, uh, what species are we talking about? What is actually fished in New Zealand? And these are our top fish species, or at least the um, species that have the highest total allowable commercial catch. And, and this is something that a lot of people don't really know. They often think in New Zealand fisheries, it's all about snapper. Um, that's far from the case. Hokie is our number one fish species, followed by arrow squid, jack mackerel, um, southern blue whiting. And, and at least for Hokie, the total allowable commercial catch is around about 115,000 tonnes per year, whereas if you look at snapper, it's only around about 6,500 tonnes. So with the data that I present, just bear in mind that you might think, well, that's not how um, the, the snapper stocks are. Just bear in mind that this is data that's probably coming from the largest, the highest volume um, stocks within New Zealand. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this um, uh, maximum sustainable yield curve from um, Boris Worm, and it basically is a plot showing percent of maximum on a y-axis, and we're going to look at how two rates are affected by exploitation. This is basically fishing pressure on the x-axis. Exploitation rate is denoted as u. So we're going to look to see how total catch and total biomass is affected by exploitation rate. We're going to look at um, targets of the fishery. So as you go out fishing, as you increase exploitation rate, generally what happens is that total catch will go up to a peak and then decline. And the reason for that is that Matt sort of um, um, mentioned this is that generally whenever a, whenever a fishery starts up, what the intention is, is to drop total biomass shown here in green down. So as you bring total biomass down, you generally find that total catch will go up to this peak and then decline. And the reason for that is that you're basically freeing up space. You're, you're improving productivity through density dependent processes. By reducing the density, you effectively um, provide more space, more resources to those individuals. You stimulate productivity. And if you can basically harvest that surplus yield through that increase in, in um, in space and productivity, you can basically maximize your catch. But as you drop the biomass down, you basically um, can leave too few individuals in that population and total catch will go down because it becomes harder for that stock to reproduce and find mates, etc. And so you don't have as much surplus yield. So 
the principle of maximum sustainable yield is to find that peak to actually fish on this peak where you've got an, uh, the highest level of total catch. You want to bring your biomass down the green line shown here, you want to bring your biomass down to a level that can support that total catch level. And the, the other target is that fishermen want to know, well, what is the, the exploitation rate, the U rate that supports maximum sustainable yield? So they want to go fishing here, bring the biomass to basically about 40% of maximum. Sometimes we refer to um, maximum biomass as a virgin biomass. It's B0. So I may refer to that again. Okay, so these are the targets. But um, generally, um, these are pretty small targets, the maximum sustainable, it's really hard to sit on this. Um, fishermen can basically go out and catch about 90%. Imagine you go out and you want to fish 90% of the total catch. Well, you can either, you can get 90% of the total catch by um, involving a low exploitation rate or a high exploitation rate. Yeah. Now, if we look on that left hand side, if we go out and fish at a low exploitation rate, get 90% of the catch, your biomass level needs to be a little bit higher. So your biomass level is greater than the BMSY level. Okay, BMSY, remember, is around about here. And then your exploitation rate is less than UMSY. So basically your fish stock, um, your biomass level is nice and high. It's always in uh, being on this left hand side of this plot, you're always in a rebuilding phase. Conversely, if you put in a high exploitation rate, um, B, your biomass level is going to be less than your BMSY target, and you're going to be fishing at quite a high level. Uh, you're going to be fishing higher than the level of exploitation rate to achieve maximum sustainable yield. You don't want to be necessarily on this right-hand side because you're going to be overfishing. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is basically show you the data from um, Ray Hilborn, amongst a whole heap of others, that were really looking at, um, they looked at all the data that was in a, a RAM legacy database um, provided by a number of um, countries. I have to say that it's mainly present for more developed countries. There's a lot of countries that we have no data for um, whatsoever, but they were basically looking at the biomass levels relative to these BMSY targets. They were looking at exploitation rate relative to the exploitation MSY targets as well. And they looked at it across from 1975 to 2015. And here's the data. Here's the main plot from that particular um, publication. So there's a whole heap of oceans um, being surveyed here. And here's New Zealand. And you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, am I going to have to interpret all of these lines? This looks this looks hellishly complicated. Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of break it down for you and, and try and explain a few trends in this. Um, New Zealand, by and large, is similar to a lot of other countries like um, Australia, um, the US West Coast, particularly sort of, you know, the Canadian West Coast areas is that what we've generally seen with biomass, and here it's shown in orange, is that biomass levels were basically from 1975 through to 2015, biomass levels came down. But you remember those publications that I was showing you about the sort of, um, um, the um, by, um, by, Boris Worm and, and the others that were showing catastrophic depletion of predatory fish communities and, and those um, high profile publications, they appeared around about the 1990s, early 2000s. And, and again, that entered into the minds of the general public and, and, and the feeling was is that world stocks were not in a good state. So a lot of regulation came into place at around about that time and generally biomass levels have been on the um, have been on the up since about the 1990s and early 2000s. So you can see these lines. Here we look at New Zealand. Its biomass levels have come down, and they're basically starting to creep back up. If we look at fishing pressure or exploitation rate, you can see that basically exploitation rate went up and it's gone back down, and therefore that's why um, the biomass level is rebuilding. OK, so generally, as a rule of thumb, that this is the situation in a lot of countries, particularly those countries that have very good management systems or, or 
you know, amongst the better management systems, I'm not suggesting that all management systems are perfect, but where good active management systems are in place, like the quota management system, these trends are evident. So Ray Hilborn's sort of general philosophy is that management works. It is actually helping to improve biomass levels and pull back in the face of undeniable overfishing. Um, it allows fishing pressure to be scaled back and for biomass levels to um, rebuild. Okay. So where does this, you know, within the multi-species MSY model, how does um, New Zealand fit into this? So I showed you the plot here. So if I just basically place it up here on this MSY model, you can see in 1975, biomass levels were pretty high. Um, again, this is overall, this is for all the species that information was present on and exploitation rate was pretty low. If we go ahead 10 years, go to 1985, Fishing pressure was increasing. You can see exploitation rate increasing, biomass levels coming down. We um, go ahead another 10 years. You can see biomass levels coming down, exploitation rate going up. But you notice that we're always on the left-hand side of this maximum sustainable yield um, model. Let's go ahead to 2005. Again, we're approaching. This is probably about the closest that we've come to that. MMSY um, level. We go ahead another 10 years to 2015 and we've actually backtracked. Biomass levels have actually increased and exploitation rates have actually um, decreased. Okay, now what I want to do is show you, um, just to compare New Zealand to other parts around the world, I'm going to show you a bad case. This is a place that you don't necessarily want to be. Um, we're going to have a look at the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has a lot of um, exclusive economic zones around the borders. We've got Italy, Spain, Greece, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They've all got their own territorial sea. Um, so in this particular place, what we can see is that biomass has generally decreased, shown here in the orange, and exploitation rate has generally increased. Now, if I show you what how that relates to our UMSY and BMSY targets. Um, if we look at 1975, so we go back, we can already see that biomass levels are actually down pretty low. Exploitation levels are already up pretty high. I'm going to go ahead quite a number of years now. Let's go ahead 20 years. You can now see that biomass levels have come down to the right-hand side of this model. We've actually entered an overfishing zone for this particular realm, again, for all species that are, are known, and exploitation rate has gone up as well. Go ahead to 2015, and it just gets worse. Exploitation rate is really high. Basically, all these countries are buying boats and are um, overcapitalized and um, they're fishing too high and biomass levels are in the wrong place. Okay, so New Zealand um, generally um, look to be fishing at a sustainable level. If we talk about exploitation levels, it looks to be that they're fishing at a sustainable level. I'm not necessarily talking about conservation of other species. We're talking about sustainable fishing. To be able to go out fishing year in, year out, they're on at least the, the correct side of, of BMSY. But, and this is a big but, and it's something that, um, that Matt um, was certainly talking about a lot, is that there's a lot of unknown, a lot of unknowns in our data. Um, if we ask the question, and it was asked in, it's always asked with the state of stocks um, reports each year. So in 2019, it was asked, are stocks at or above target levels? So the target levels being BMSY. If we look at the number of stocks, I haven't included the nominal stocks. I've only looked at the important stocks here. So all up, there's probably, I think there's something like 380 important stocks. Around about 225 of those, we have absolutely no information on. Um, there's nothing. Um, so um, at least those 225 stocks, um, they're only comprising about 31% of total catch volume. So it's not a big fraction of the, um, the total catch from those particular stocks. But if we look at the, the really important ones, the ones that we do have information on, these comprise these are basically giving us about 70% of our total catch by volume. You can see that there's all these shades of different colors 
And, and a lot of um, fisheries assessments is, is all about probabilities. There's a lot of uncertainty within these assessments. And that's because BMSY is really hard to ascertain. Virgin biomass is really hard to ascertain. It's really hard to establish our, um, our reference points, our soft limits, our hard limits. So even for the stocks that we actually have quite good information on, it's all really quite uncertain. So a lot of the language is, is written like exceptionally, are the stocks at or above target levels? Exceptionally unlikely, very unlikely, um, likely, very likely, or virtually certain. So as a rule of thumb, we know very little about a lot of stocks. What we, for the stocks that we do know about, a lot of the data is really hard to obtain and it's quite uncertain. It's all about probability and estimates. And generally, not all those stocks are actually um, um, quantified. They're not assessed the whole time. You can see here that there's time since the last assessment. You can see that there's a number of stocks, at least 10 of those, that haven't actually been assessed for over 10 years. So big uncertainty. And, and again, um, not all of them. I, I, the Ray Hilborn's data suggests that we're in really good state. But there's a number of stocks that are actually not in good state. Nine stocks in 2020 were um, suggested to be collapsed, so basically down um, below the hard limit, the 10% biomass hard limit. These include the species down here. 28 stocks were generally considered to be um, overfished, so including Terraki and Snapper. So if we actually look at some individual stocks, um, the big ones, the ones that are really well managed, um, the likes of Hoki are probably in, they're, they're in support it, probability is really high that they're in good good state but for individual stocks things aren't necessarily looking quite so good so if we look at snapper one um you can see here how biomass for the eat this is um two sub stocks so east north island um stock here on the left hand side the haraki gulf and bay of plenty sub stock on the right hand side you can see how biomass has basically come down from the 1900s it this is our BMSY target at 40% of virgin biomass here. It basically plummeted through that in the 1980s. It hit the soft limit around about the sort of 1990s, and it's been wavering around about the 20% biomass soft limit um, since that time. Um, again, for the Haraki Gulf and Bay of Plenty stock, it even um, came very close to the 10%. So this is the biomass level being down about 10% level. Um, yeah, it's been down there and between the hard limit and the soft limit for quite some time. So at least up to 2013, um, officially the stocks were considered to be overfished because exploitation rate was above the um, exploitation rate required to hit MSY. So generally things are looking pretty good, but for a few stocks around the country, they're not necessarily at target level. Okay, so that would be um, my overall conclusion. So um, one of the things that I was asked to um, consider was um, how do we actually, how does resource utilization, how does fisheries actually balance up? How does it actually, um, how does it, how does it balance with conservation? And, and I'd like to sort of just refer back to the um, multi-species MSY model of, of worm and others at 2009, because one thing that I didn't actually plot out initially was a third line. And what they actually showed or what they were suggesting within their sort of conceptual model is that as you increase exploitation rate, the percentage of collapsed species will actually increase. So it's very, very critical. Um, if you don't want collapsed species, it's very critical which side of this particular model that you're out um, fishing on. If you're fishing on the right-hand side, you're likely to be leading to a higher number of collapsed species. And that's because fishing is not squeaky clean. Um, fishing has impacts and the impacts can be actually quite hard. Trawling, I think, which um, um, comprise about 80 to 90% of our um, total fish stock volume. Um, trawling um, is used. It has heavy impacts on the sea floor. We see a, a marked reduction in the abundance and biodiversity of species. Depending on substrate, seafloor substrates, the effects can be really quite long lasting. Um, we see 
uh, bycatch is is unavoidable. We see a coexistence of different species, so bycatch um, can be um, reasonable, reasonably high. We can see um, species like sea lion interactions with trawled gear, which is not a good thing, and and certainly doesn't um, um, bode well in terms of social license. So. Um, so generally, if you're looking, and this is where the conflict um, kind of comes in, if you're heavily into conservation, then you're likely to want to see exploitation rate as low as possible. Um, you want to see the, the lowest form of collapsed species, but that has a direct um, conflict with efficient resource utilization, because to have efficient resource utilization, you want to be fishing at, um, at MSY targets. So the question is, is that, um, you know, everyone always has different opinions. Everyone, or, everyone sits somewhere on this spectrum between conservation and efficient resource utilization. We all have different standards and we have different values, but whether or not, and this is the challenge I see for um, future New Zealand fisheries is, can we find a balance between these two? Can we shift? Can we only operate? Can we only fish on that left-hand side of that maximum sustainable yield model where we basically can have the highest possible um, total catch we can hold our biomass levels nice and high, so it's always in a sort of rebuilding phase, and we can keep our collapsed species um, down as low as potentially possible. If we can get away from that right-hand site, a lot of our um, um, fishing standard reference points are basically on this right-hand site. So MSY, BMSY targets around about 40%. Our soft limit is about 20%. Our hard limit is at about 10%, clearly on the right-hand side. Um, as Matt said, um, actually getting traction from government and getting things to roll is is super, super hard and, and a really long process. But for me, the long term goal would be to actually um, change our reference points and, and to actually fish on this left hand side and treat BMSY almost as our soft limit rather than all the way down here. Um, so we basically are sliding up and down on this scale here, rather than as we currently are um, generally sort of sliding up and down, down here, um, for at least for individual stocks. Very easy for fishing to go down to um, soft limits, very easy. But I'd like to think that maybe our soft limit could be set a little bit higher. Okay, so um, this is something I was looking to see how sort of fisheries management sort of um, scored. Um, against the rest of the world. And, and it's something that I, I show in fisheries and aquaculture. It's an old report, comes from 2008. And I was going to update it, show you um, um, reports that are a little bit more recent, not that I'm particularly um, familiar with them, but I kind of want to show the slow rate of change within, um, if, if, you know, th things can be pointed out as being bad, but things don't change quick. And this kind of the, the date on this report exemplifies that. So this report done by Tony Pitcher et al for the World Wildlife Fund, basically placed New Zealand eighth um, in terms of um, code compliance score. So they came up with these high scorings and said, look, the management framework is, is good. You know, the QMS is good. The, we've generally, New Zealand is compared to say the Mediterranean, we've had a precautionary approach. We've, we've generally come down that, um, the biomass scale, our exploitation rates have been generally on the right side of things. And they said that we did well in terms of sort of um, MSC indicators. So this MSC is um, the uh, marine, uh, marine, I forget the name of it, it's um, marine, Stewardship Council, that's correct. And our low scorings were basically scale of no take zones that generally has improved a bit. I was hoping that um, Nick Shears was going to talk today and tell us a bit about no take zones. Um, species interactions, and this is the point that I want to really sort of focus on. I'm gonna talk about species interaction and MSC indicators because things generally haven't really sort of changed from 2008 despite the fact that we've got a low scoring for species interactions. And the reason for that is that New Zealand fisheries is still pretty much based on 
single species. So the quota management system really just looks at one species at a time. It's not looking to see how different species are interacting with others. Um, so we're not looking at, you know, if we're going out fishing for hokey, how's that having an impact on, on other um, prey items or, um, you know, or even the predators of hokey, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we're generally still in, we're still in that mindset of single species, but um, there are two positive directions in, in my opinion, um, and Matt sort of highlighted the difficulties of heading in this direction, um, but I do see that the ecosystem approach to fisheries management is is a step in the right direction where basically ecosystem function is considered holistically. So we're not only looking at food web interactions, we're looking at sort of ecological processes. We can model out how different fishing pressures can, can influence those interactions and come up with the best, the best fit where basically we get a balance between conservation uh, well, hopefully a balance, a good balance between conservation and um, resource exploitation. So um, Matt, uh, I was surprised actually that Matt didn't tell us about the um, Atlantis um, ecosystem model, because it is actually something that he's working on, but 20 minutes and I'm sure I'm well over my time now. <laughs> um, 20 minutes is not very long to talk about everything. But anyway, I mentioned two positive directions. So I see ecosystem approach to fisheries management as one. Um, again, there's difficulties in the, the amount of information that's required for this is, is, it's, it's, it's an insurmountable task probably. And we, you know, as Matt says, we'll probably never get there, but it would be good to see things heading, considerations heading more in this direction where we're considering more multi-species interactions rather than just the single species interaction. The other um, positive direction I see is eco certification. So this um, MSC labeling, the Marine Stewardship Council. So for those of you that are not familiar with this, fisheries are basically scored on three standards. So for one, the stock status needs to be good. We need to basically make sure that we've always got fish in the sea for future generations. That has to be proved. Um, has to be shown that there's um, a minimization of environmental impact. Um, and also the management has to be good and responsive. If change is required, the management has to be at a sufficient level that it can respond to change as and when it's required. So um, I, I feel like we're actually pretty good in, in this particular field within New Zealand. Seven species have MSC certification here in New Zealand, and these account for a, a very large fraction of our total fisheries volume. So greater than 50% of New Zealand fisheries volume is MSC certified, certified, and almost 75 of our deep water species is MSC um, certified. So the species listed are down here, you can see, um, and I challenge you to go into the supermarkets and look around for this MSC label. It's, it's almost a, a label for, um, sustainability, if you like, that's at least what MSC claim. Um, and you can find those products according to this blue little label down here on the products. So you can see it on this boxed um, set of hokey fillets. This isn't a perfect process and the MSC labeling is heavily criticized um, basically because we're probably, if, if species actually slip down from the MSY target and it hits a soft limit, they're not necessarily penalized. Um, it doesn't fully consider the, the extent of, um, of collapse taxa, for example. Um, but I would argue that this particular MSC labeling is better, it's far better for our fisheries that we have fisheries that have this MSC label than not have it. Um, for example, if we look at Hokie, um, the Hokie fishermen are incentivized to have this MSC label because it allows them to actually sell their product into lucrative markets. If they didn't go for this, if they didn't have this MSC label, if it wasn't a big incentive for them, they wouldn't be motivated to hit their targets in terms of BMSY and also exploitation rate, but they are motivated to make sure that they're actually fishing within the um, BMSY targets. They wouldn't necessarily be motivated to apply these torrey lines to keep um, um, vulnerable seabirds away from the, the net as, it, as it's being brought up to the surface. 
they wouldn't have awful um, discharge um, regulations. They wouldn't be as incentivized to put these things in place. They probably wouldn't be as, in, as, as incentivized to add um, these seal excluder devices to trawling nets as well. So by and large, I see it as a, as a positive thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're bringing our um, fish stocks into that low rate of collapse we still hokey is still involved in bottom trawling so it will still invariably have environmental impacts through that um, touching down of of our bottom trawlers there is no doubt about that so anyway just the final slide here um i basically um i've taken this particular screenshot from seafood new zealand um, .org .nz, and it's saying choose your sustainable new zealand seafood species one thing i'd like to see more in the future is clear labeling of our products where they actually come from this even though it's on the um it's saying choose your sustainable new zealand seafood species is this particular species we need a label actually on this species um, it's snapper here, um, which stock has this particular snapper species um, come from? Some stocks are in better state than others. Um, the same goes for all of these other species. And it's what I like about the MSC label is it gives you an idea of um, at least those fishermen doing the very best that they possibly can. Okay, so choose your products wisely. If we look at these tins of tuna, you can see here the John West one has the MSC label. We've got another sea lord one here, it says it's responsibly caught, but how? If we look on the back of the tin, it says tuna, 65%. What species? Um, I certainly hope it's not southern bluefin tuna. I, I'm, I'm sure it absolutely isn't, but you know, clear labeling. What species are we looking at? Where is it from? Um, is it sustainable? Are the fishermen really doing the best they can? Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there um, and happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. In the benefit of time, we'll allow a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, he's coming to the mic. Okay, thank you. Just um, prior to observer coverage, did we get all our um, data from fishers, were it pro provided by fishers, and how accurate, how did we accurately assess that? prior to the observer coverage. I know from 2013, as you sh showed on the graph, we had observer coverage on most, or 20, at least 25% of the snapper fleet and our biomass started to go up gradually. But prior to that, and with respect to the other stocks, how do we know they're sitting at such a high level before, if you like? Yeah, I mean, it has to, a lot of it was based on on trust and and landings um reported landings and and yeah i mean we you're right before observer coverage we we can't be necessarily 100 percent confident of all that data um and yeah and and i guess sort of in in certainly previous years um yeah, there have been sort of um, rumours running that, you know, sort of high grading was was taking place where where um, fish were being caught and, and, you know, the lower value catch was dumped over the side. And um, in reality, I don't know what sort of how reliable that data is. I don't I don't I don't know if anyone is necessarily too sure. Um, certainly these days, um, I guess nowadays the, the modern fleets have a different sort of um, um, breed of fishermen. Um, they're, they're generally very responsible. They, they're incentivized to look after the stocks. I think we're dealing these days with, um, yeah, different fishing practice, um, at least in the, the bigger fisheries. Um, there's too much at stake for those fisheries to collapse. So um, there's basically um, skin in the game. So, but yeah again there's there's a lot of vagueness a lot of um poor information and and probably a lot of the information where we think it's it's good is probably far less than perfect yeah thank you very much neil um if we don't have any more questions oh one more so for a 20 percent biomass why are there no more strict measures because that's really low already um, to bring it up to 40 percent or higher it's the level it's the harvest 
um, it's the harvest standard that's been set by government, and I guess it's just been um, retained. Um, and I agree, it's 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 not really. I guess BMSY is is always been seen as the target, but it's quite. It is a small target to hit, and it's and it's easy to um, overshoot it. And and I guess twenty percent, you know, within fisheries management, um, within stock assessments, it's it's really hard. Forty percent to twenty percent is, um, in a lot of cases, it's not really it's not really easy to resolve the difference between forty percent and and twenty percent. For example, I think within Hokey, um, the BMSY target isn't actually taken as forty percent. It it's generally seen as a range between. 35 um, up to um, up to 50 percent and that's because it's seen that 40 percent is is too close to the 20 percent limit and and it's easy to to make a, an error in those particular calculations so I guess in hitting the BMSY target at the 40 percent level it's easy to overshoot and and get down to a, a soft limit um, but my view is is that maybe we should actually just shift that shift those targets if it's easy to overshoot why don't we set our um, bmsy target um, sorry not a bmsy why don't we set our biomass target above bmsy and allow an overshoot to bmsy and, and in that particular situation it'll actually be advantageous to the fishermen to overshoot because their catch will go up if the stock is increasing to um, a BMSY level. They will actually get higher catches if they overshoot from um, a higher a higher limit. And we we'll give you this round of applause. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Francisco Blaha. Francisco's experience ranges across the fisheries sector since the 1980s. Um, we're going to shift from New Zealand to the Pacific region now. And he actually started in the deck of a fishing vessel and he worked his way up to um, his present position as an independent fisheries senior advisor for over 30 multilateral organizations, government institutions, NGOs, and technology providers on a wide range of fisheries related areas in more than 55 countries worldwide. He holds a Master in Science in Fishery Science and a Master in Science in Food Science. His work focuses on fisheries monitoring, control, and surveillance, port state measures, catch documentation schemes, electronic reporting, and monitoring. He's also actively involved on commercial fishers and fisheries inspectors' labor rights. Based on the South Pacific since 1991 and in New Zealand since 1995, he is Comfortable, comfortable, sorry, in boats, factories, and boardrooms. And he said mostly in that order. And he maintains a popular fisheries blog and photographic gallery on his website, www.franciscoblaha.info, and was presented in 2019 the Seafood Champion Award for his advocacy work. So um, let's give him a round of applause to welcome him. Um. I keep it there. Anyway, thank you guys. Um, just gonna move from New Zealand to where I live, but to the Pacific where I work. So before they start, uh, I wanna make sure that we get something clear. I no way or form I speak for the Pacific, I speak with the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, I'm, I'm a guest in the Pacific and uh, nobody needs someone else to speak on the far. Uh, white savior should have stopped a long time ago. Okay, say that, uh, this is me, what I do, blah, blah, blah. I actually graduated from my master's here, but uh, I'm sort of mostly a, of a qualified fisherman. So what are we talking about? We talk the Pacific. Uh, okay, people go, oh, the Pacific. You know that pretty much every, every landmass in the world will hit will enter the Pacific. It's one of the few oceans that if you go from one end to the other, you go around the world. So I'm gonna be focusing on the Western and Central Pacific, which is the area I work. Uh, when you work in fisheries in this aspect, you work on under the structure of regional fisheries management organizations. And we have two, one on the East and one on the West. So I'm gonna talk about the one in the West. Uh, how important is this? Well, this shows you more or less how much money fisheries represent for the Pacific Islands. Yeah, so we have from PNG, which is where it's 4%, because mining, mining is the biggest thing, all the way to Tokelau, 
where we will be, uh, which, yeah, where we're talking about 81% of government revenues. Yep. So if we ever think about, oh, no more fisheries, uh, just think about what's going to happen to those countries. Uh, most of my work is in the Marshall Islands and Kiribati where uh, government revenue is 45% in the Marshall Islands, mostly because the rest is uh, reparations by the US from the nuclear destruction they did there. For Kiribati, it's almost 70%. Uh, then these are figures that are a few years old, and the COVID, the situation is radically different because tourism stopped existing. So how much fish we're talking? We're talking... Uh, for Western and Central Pacific, almost 3 million tons. This is a lot of fish. So for you to have an idea how much fish is caught, how much tuna is caught of the four species in the Pacific, you will see uh, that it's more fish, more tuna caught in the Western and Central Pacific than in the Indian Ocean, the Eastern Pacific, and the Atlantic put together. Yep. If we're talking the Indian Ocean, uh, Kiribati alone, will be pretty much up there. If you have a Kiribati and Papua New Guinea, you pretty much have already whatever is caught in the Indian Ocean. So it's a lot of fish and it's a big ocean. How does the system operate? Well, here we get a bit, a bit more complicated. So we have the light blue section is the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. That is the RFMO that manages the whole structure of the fishery where he has his members and they all sit and we agree on not or disagree on things. Then we have two organizations, uh, but, the, but the Pacific Island Fisheries Forum Agency, aka FFA, which is the best regional organization of fisheries you never heard of. It's gonna be going on for 40 years now. And it's the reason why we still have a fishery in the Pacific in my opinion. And then SPC that deals with the science. These are the two regional organizations that provide support to the members. The Pacific Island uh, countries, when they decide, when the system of UNCLOS, the EEZ, came part of it, decided, look, we are too small to work things independently. So let's get together and work regionally. And the link, so the name of this, the, 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 the motto of this organization is strength through cooperation. Then we have a group called the PNA, the Paris of the Nauru Agreement, which is where I will say 70% of the skipjack, which is the one that finished in the can, is being caught for. And they operate for tuna the way OPEC operate for oil. They manage supply in order to maintain prices. And then you have on the other side, the countries. You have the PNA nations first, then you have the FFA countries, which is all the independent Pacific Island countries plus Australia and New Zealand. And then you have the Western and Central um, Pacific, Western and Central Pacific uh, fisheries commit, uh, commission meetings, which are what we call the distant water fishing nations. They don't relate to the, to the zone, they relate to this part of the ocean, but they're very important. And the usual suspects, China, USA, Chinese Taipei, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, et cetera. So the decisions on the fishery is made all through the system, yet the biggest players, as we're gonna see, are the Pacific Island countries. Um, terrible, uh, terrible slide, uh, not my fault, of course, uh, but basically the overall by the Pacific, Western Central Pacific is all managed by consensus. People sit, negotiate, decides what's gonna happen. SPC does the science and data service. FFA does fisheries policy management and compliance. And PNA is a group of the FFA on commercialization of uh, person tuna. And then it's the national governments, which all of it, each of them, brings its own thing. For example, for the Marshall Islands, the interests are different than for Fiji because the fisheries are different even if they are operating under the same principles. So just to deal with this, is, is, it will be under normal circumstances, pretty much two days of uh, explanation. I'm trying to do it in less than 20 minutes, so I'm keeping to my timing. Uh, this I'm gonna leave this with uh, Carla, so more than happy to, if you say some, some remote, reason, have interest on how this work, you're most welcome. What is happening with tuna in the region? Well, because there's been 40 years of small countries working together, uh, the four stocks are on, and I'm not good that we, you had the fisheries biology before because it explains what we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability. 
or what we're talking about, we talked about overfishing and underfishing. And one thing that is important that I, I never hear that sustainability and environmental impact work in parallel, yeah? Something can be sustainable while still having environmental impact. And reality is that as long as you eat, you will have some environmental impact. But that's, a, that's another two days of discussion one day. What can you see here from the Majuro plot, which is where we have the four stocks and we have the, the, the distribution in green, orange, and red. So for the moment, and this is not because, um, this is not a coincidence. This is pretty much 20 years of people working towards this, this outcome. Yeah. So this is one of the few good stories in fisheries. The four stocks at different levels are on the green. This one I really like because basically it shows again the volumes, yeah, on tons versus the condition on the different oceans. So we have the Eastern Pacific, we have the Central Pacific, which is the big green finger in the middle, and then we have the Indian Ocean and we have the Atlantic. At the moment, the four stocks that we deal with mostly are in good conditions, are not overfished and not overfishing is occurring, which doesn't mean that more fishing can occur. And that is where the 17 member states of FFA pull the muscle. The fact that it's good doesn't mean that it should be more. And I spent my last two days on uh, big conversations because of course the Western, uh, distant water fishing nations want to, want to increase capacity and the Pacific Island nations say, well, no, because it's our fish. And we will get to this, our fish later on a little bit. But this again, when you think that everything is bad, think that at least one is okay, but this is not happen by coincidence. This is a hell of a lot of work from a hell of a lot of people. You never know anything because they never make it to the news. By catch, yes, we have more work to do again. This is part of what, there is no silver bullets when you work in fisheries. I wish they were, they are not. There's always things to work further, but that is the reason we shouldn't give up. So as you can see, um, oceanic white tip uh, is not good at all. Serpent marlin is uh, in the borderline. Swordfish is uh, pushing it and um, silky shark is here, yeah, gone. On the other side, oh, you have the, you see the seabird captures uh, by density, just two close examples of it. You can see this and you go, oh, God, no, yes, oh God. Blah, blah, blah. But then on the other side, this is the trend. Yeah. So yes, we have problems. Yes, there are solutions being worked out. They're not magical. They're never gonna happen tomorrow. But if you give up, then they will never happen. Uh, People go, well, you know, but this is all the people taking it and uh, they just get away and the fish goes away and it's all bad. And it's like, well, yes, no, no it's not yes, but you see, this is the value uh, by domestic fishery. So fishing vessels flag in the Pacific Islands. This is their fish, they are catching it. The ownership of the vessels is a different story, but at least they're flagged there and they are with bases on those countries and they have crew of those countries. So the train line is getting bigger and we're getting better um, in terms of how much of the value is retained in the region instead of just going to the distant water fishing nations. Uh, license and revenue. Uh, when I came to the region, the Pacific Islands, this is in 1991, we're receiving around $30 million out of the fishery. At the moment, we are peaking on 850 million. And this is from 1991 to now. So uh, different, different setups for different, for different types of fishing, et cetera, et cetera. But we went towards the target that has been achieved and the train line is doing positively. Employment, yeah. As people go, as you know, in the news, you know, people complaining about there's not enough people to work in New Zealand. And most of the people that are coming is from Pacific Islands to go and work in York, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we have the issue of we have people there that need work and we are trying to find out how to get it to work on boats and it's happening. And the biggest employment is actually, as you can see, uh, increasing observers. The observer program for the Pacific fleet is the biggest one in the world, 2000 placements. This is pre-COVID. Unfortunately, we don't have observers now, but they're getting there. Harvest, working on fishing boats and public sector, people working on administrations and science. So they're getting better now. Sorry, let's go. Now, what about IUU fishing? Everyone hears about IUU fishing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, back when I was still a student, I used to hang out at BFM and used to have a program there. And I always like this little uh, mixer there because there is no one, IUU is just not one thing. It's different things happening at once and the different mixes at different places. The, steep, the type of uh, IUU fishing illegal and regulated and reported fishing we have, for example, in the Western Central Pacific is mostly about misreporting. There's no illegal vessels. And can we I talk to you how we know this? Yet, if we talk about the Atlantic coast in East Africa, it's all about illegal. Basically, they shouldn't be there and they are there. So different places, different mixes. You cannot say that the whole thing works at once the same way. Um, this is a picture of the... Um, uh, monitoring and control room of FFA in the, in the Marshall Islands. Each of those vessels is a vessel that uh, has to be on a listing. And the colors that those vessels you have are based on the compliance history. This has been going over for 20 years now. And we have a series of tools that we use for that. I'm not going to go into details of each, but at least they exist. And they exist for a long time. Um, this is the main room. Now is a, we have even more, uh, more uh, TV uh, things. And uh, you see, this is our risk. So for example, uh, high risk FFA vessel, uh, medium risk, low risk, either from through the VMS, which is the vessel monitoring systems, or through the IIS, which is a system that if you know about Global Fishing Watch, that is basically, it's a sense, it's a, sen it's a collision element on a vessel that we can manage to abstract an um, anti-collision system, and we know where they are and who they are. Uh, four times a year, this is the biggest ocean in the world, four times a year, uh, the Pacific Islands gets with the help of New Zealand, Australia, France, and the US Navy, and we do four times a year, um, send planes and send boats to go through the ocean doing transects, and we look down from the plane, and the guy on the office goes, well, okay, on our system, two miles ahead, so many degrees, you will have this vessel. And the guy on the plane, yeah, yeah, it's there. Now, then the guy on the on the plane will say, "Oh, there is a vessel here that you you have it." The guy on land will say, "No." Then the vessel they take them a, a picture and they send the boats to intercept it and see what happened. For the last five years, these four operations have come nil. No vessel is there that shouldn't be there. That is license. Uh, furthermore. Uh, this all these countries because traditionally what we used to do is that you know Japan would go or the Korea would go and say oh you know we do a deal here and they say and you go no 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 oh, but you know he says that he'd take it so they were playing them apart so all the countries go together and says we have harmonized license conditions so harmonized license conditions means that if you want to fish in any country of those that you show on the FFA any of the 17 Pacific island countries, you need to comply with the same requirements for all of them, or you don't fish. And amazingly, since the 1st of January of 2020, and this is the only organization in the world who does this, minimal labor standards for the crew on board is part of that equation. So far, you, I could go on board, see uh, a guy being crucified there. I can call the police, I can do something, but I cannot take the fishing license of that vessel because that is a labor issue and it's not a fishing issue, not anymore in the Pacific. We have registers, so there's two main registers, the FFA register and the commission register where every vessel that fish is to be there. If it's not there, then we have all the tools to prosecute the vessel. Observer programs over 2000 deployments a year is not always good because per se has 100% coverage. So every vessel that goes fishing has an observer on long line is much smaller, it's 5%. You know, there is issues, but 
they were there and they were a lot of the good data that you use comes from the presence of observer. Any of you have an interest of, in fisheries, start as an observer. It's the best way to learn fisheries. Yep. Uh, we have, a, I'm gonna go with the details, but we have a system of information management that is not perfect, but it's, you know, I'm gonna talk about this. All the countries share the information and compliance about this. Uh, people are talking about, oh, we're gonna have cameras on board. Uh, the first program that I started, I worked on the Marshall Islands is now nine years. Yep, so it happens. We have issues with it, of course, because they require money, people, time, which is not always available, particularly in the Pacific. Um, in 2016, we made an, a quantification of the, uh, the, how much we were losing to IUU fishing. Uh, 2016, around uh, 616 million, yet the potential economic loss for the Pacific Island members was around 152. Uh, mostly was not illegal, was about misreporting. Uh, I'm hoping that we can finish the 2020 update where we find that since 2016 to now, there has been around 50% reduction. This from increasing controls, but also from much better data from the holes we found in 2016. So again, wouldn't hear much in the news of this, but this is, you know, Pacific Island countries looking after themselves and getting the best. We're working with the scales. I don't know if you see when you do transshipment, this is the scale at the top there. You see that there? That is the scale. So, because we know, didn't, we always works on estimates. We always works on estimates in fisheries. You don't really know. So now, every time the fish gets from one boat to the other, we get to read how much is being transferred. That, of course, helps science. Science helps policy policy helps monitoring control and surveillance. And fish, sustainable fisheries is, in my opinion, like a leg, like a table with three legs. Good policy, good science, good monitoring, control and surveillance. They retrofit each other. If one is weak, they fall. Uh, we're working on catch documentation schemes. Basically, how can, can I go to, you know, a country like Tuvalu with 11,000 people living there and there is an ATM and I can make an extraction and that is okay, yet we cannot know how much is being caught where, when. Yeah, when money is an intangible, just data moving on and fish is very tangible. So this is all areas we are working. Well, we challenges plenty and data is the first one. So if you wanna really move into the fisheries realm and I will su suggest you do, the more you understand data and big management of data, the better. 2010, we had a lot of databases. Today we are working in databases and tomorrow we hope to have a centralized database. And I'm, not, I'm looking more to learn from what banking is doing than from what the police is doing. Because at the end of the day, it works more like fisheries management data works more on this, just like a bank, because we have the same issues. We have issues around money laundering. We have issues around fish laundering. We have issues around... Uh, <clears throat> this connection in between who buys and who sells, et cetera, et cetera. So the banking model is one that I'm really keen on more than you know the police model. Um, fantastic to have cameras, but they are expensive. Not the camera, the operationality of the cameras is expensive. You need a lot of people. You need to have people who sit and goes through uh, footage. Not all the footage works all the time the same way. If we are doing a troll, then we have two events in the day. If we are doing long line, we have 12 hours of footage. So we have to, we're using uh, machine learning, we use artificial intelligence to get over the data, et cetera, et cetera. Yet the hard drive needs to come from the boat down to the place where this happens. So saying, ah, oh, we have to put cameras, you have to put cameras, that is just the top of the iceberg. Honestly, it's get much more complicated. Yet it's happening. Always focus on the positive. Um, high cistern shipment, a complete headache because as long as it happens in our waters, we can know and we have power, but if it happens in the high seas, we don't. Uh, and we had a impracticability exemption on the CMM, which is the regulation for the whole region, but that is, we cannot impose it on because you know a, a vessel is a chunk of the country that is floating somewhere. So whatever happens on a vessel depends on the flag. So some flag states are much responsible than others. 
for example, we had a massive increase from 2004 to now, and there is three countries that are responsible for that. And the countries that we have no much capacity, even if one of them is a member of uh, the Pacific Island. So it's not always easy, yet, you know, we are working on things. So I don't know if you know much about FATS, but that's a big issue. Now, FATS is fish aggregation devices. By some reason, tuna likes to hang out about things that float, which was okay because we couldn't find it. But then now we have people who buy, who build this little box is there. This little box has in one piece, two sonars that do uh, sounding, an Iridium GPS self-sustained network with solar batteries. So a vessel has 300 of those. They are attached to the, to the farts and I'm sitting in the deck of the boat and I can see how much fish is underneath each of them. I can see how, if there is more or less than yesterday, and because they respond to two different frequencies, the separation of species of what is underneath. So fishing on one side is become now, now like drawing by numbers. That is a threat. Yet on the other side, if I was able to harness all that information by conditioning that they can have it, but they need to share it, I could have pretty much on a big screen, instant stock assessment, because I will have 60,000 data points along the Pacific bringing up this information. Yet for that, we need consensus and we need a capacity of handling data that we don't have yet. Mm -hmm. Yet again, we know the issue. This is what we call effort creep, but that we call, don't worry, it happens there. It's happening, we are getting there. Um, labor standards, massive issue. That has nothing to do with fishing, but has a lot to do with fishing. Same job, the Brela, if the guy who was from Spanish, and this was, I, you know, that was my job when I came because, you know, I had a good passport, I was paying better. As a guy from Spain, which I'm not from Spain, I'm from Argentina, but to do a job, he will be making thousand euros uh, four months on to down. Same guy, same job, same job, guys from Ecuador, it will be doing 500 US dollars, half of it, and it will have only 75 days. If it is a guy from, at the moment is Vietnam, or even Nepal, they're bringing them in, he will be doing $350 a month, and he will not go home for three years. Yep, so, big issue. As you said, remember I told you about that we having con labor conditions as part of the licensing. Yet that means that they have a contract that, et cetera, we cannot dictate how much they get paid. Yeah. Again, but then point is that there is that related to flags and something you can do is know where the fish come from, the traceability, hopefully, and buy fish from flags that pay the people the right thing. Anyway, we keep going. Uh, this is reality in some of the Pacific Islands, you know, people here, so the, the, <laughs> The budget for the change of logo of MFish fish of New Zealand fisheries, it's pretty much more than the whole budget for fisheries in the Marshall Islands and the Solomon Islands for a while. This is this is the fisheries vehicle. This is the, um, the logo of the Ministry of Fisheries. Yep. Uh, a guy who is responsible for action and he brought $3 million in fines to one of the Pacific Island countries I work with, and it's $20,000 $20, a year. So the defunding. Why? Hey, but they're making a lot of money. Yes, but there is so many other things in the Pacific that need to be covered. Health, infrastructure, education, communications, et cetera, et cetera. And how you bring talent, how you keep talent. And this is not just Pacific. This is also our fisheries. Yep. Now, geopolitics and subsidies, a massive issue. If you have presence, you have rights. So not all fleets make money, but they get given money by the governments to be there because that is a thing. Particularly in the Pacific, where there is a big game in between China, Taiwan, and the US. Yeah? As you know, Taiwan is, you know, not seen as China as a, as a separate entity, as, as a province, and Taiwan says, no, we are independent. 
and of the 16 countries in the world that have rel diplomatic relationships with Taiwan, five are in the Pacific. So there is a big game there, a geopolitical game that has nothing to do with fisheries, but influence fisheries. Colonialism hasn't gone so far. I'm 56, 56 in September, and I'm older than all the countries I work with. How many people can say that? So uh, yet in some of those countries, I found more humanity than most of the big empires I spent time in. Climate change, huge issue for us. Huge issues for us. Why? Because the, the fish is moving east. Yep. As you see there, and the two different scenarios, uh, some of the countries are going to lose up to 20% of their, some of the regions are going to lose up to 20% of the catches because the, the fish is moving east. The problem of this is not only the loss of tuna for those men, for those uh, countries, but the fact that where you see blue and light blue, we put the rules and we can control it. But as soon as it gets out of us, there's no more rules that we can control. So, yep. So yeah, big issue. And I will say that is the biggest issue that we confront more than are you fishing or anything else, because at least on the other ones, there is things that we can do. Here is much limited what we can do. Now, the biggest challenge I find is, any one of you is considering working in fisheries? Yay! Because that is the biggest challenge I find, yeah? It's gonna be there. It's gonna, we, you know, and as I say, I, when I started work, I came from, from fishing. When I started working in consulting, people say, oh, it's good to see somebody young like you, you know, blah, blah. 20 years later, I'm still the youngest one and it's not right, you know? And if, uh, if you were to design the stereotype of a fisherman, you know, what you need, a big guy with dark skin, you know, that like this and don't believe in paper, you know? And if people like me, if my age, my agenda, my age and my background represent the only way to do things, why we have the problems we have. So how hypocritical would mean not to support and come to these places to say, please come and work with fisheries because we need you. We need diversity. We need different views. Yeah. Um, the other day, somebody told me, you know, but they're the depressed guy. Look, I'm trying to do my best, you know, but I feel like I'm a guy on the other side of the road with a big hole we know it's a big hole with a small shovel and everyone passes on the other side of the road and goes, oh, you suck and throw me stones. If you wanna change things, get involved. And why I'm, I'm pointing to you? Because, you know, okay, that's great. You know, this is, I live in Wahik on top of that, Ooh, nice. But this is the places I normally work. And of those places, 15% of the population there lives below $1 a day, yep. 45% of the world population lives below $2 a day. And that was my mom. 71% of the world population lives below $10 a day. And that was me until I was lucky to migrate to New Zealand. So we here, we are the lucky ones. We can afford to think about the future. We are the ones that can work towards sustainability. We are ones, the ones that can say transparency, good management, labor rights, this and this and that. Why? Because you have a future. The rest is trying to eat. So my challenge is if you want to get, if you are really care for fisheries, get involved. I'm on time. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So do we have any questions for Francisco? So good. Hey, too good to explain everything. Any questions here? Any questions on the chat? But the other thing is that, yeah. Great question, and I love you do it. This, it's a couple of ways to do it. So I, I jump off a fishing boat, literally, literally uh, 26 years ago, 
and I managed to go to a really good party by the 12 tribes of Israel, and that was my decision. Sound system, big trust, uh, that was my decision-making factor here. My good thing is that my, my advantage is that I actually worked as a fisherman, then worked as an observer, and I had a master's in fisheries. But my first job was as a fisherman. Yeah? So you, I will say first, if you can get involved, get your degrees, fundamental. Yeah? And then get involved either as an observer, depending what you like. As you saw, Matt, modelers, people who manage data will have a job. If you start with fisheries, you are managing, manage, you're managing resources. You can then move to, you can, if you can do your thesis on that, you can do for forestry, you can do to banking, you can do whatever, yeah? Or big data management, uh, et cetera. The other option is you know, knowing what you're looking at. So a good way to start is either get involved in fishing or if you have that, become an observer. It's in New Zealand, very safe. You learn about the industry, you learn about the species, you learn about what happened, and then move from there into either Niwa, et cetera, et cetera, or many NGOs are working on this area now, which uh, tend to be much positive. You remember, I swear never to, work, never to work with NGOs, and I'm working now with three. Yeah, in New Zealand, WWF, for example, they're trying to do good things, uh, Pew, environmental results and the uh, Stanford University Center of Ocean Excellence, you know? So, um, and I think that there is an option. Fisheries is one of the few areas where you can be a self-employed scientist, which if you care about lifestyle is tend to be a good thing. So I would say, uh, if you wanna work in fisheries, let make sure that your hands smells like fish for a while, or take the other way and see the big picture and bring the big picture to nice small graphics and to good, good UX. So the people at the ministry has the data in very simple ways for them to make decisions. Because remember, it was three elements, science, policy, and monitoring, control, and surveillance. Yeah? See where you fit on those three and move from there, I would say. Yeah, I have a question for yeah. you. Since you've had so many different roles yeah. across fisheries, uh -huh. which one's your favorite and why? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just I just get bored easily. So um, <laughs> I would say that none of the others was possible if the fishing wouldn't have started. Yeah, that was the first one. It just I work in now in in, in the MCS world, the monitoring, so, so, sort of like a controlling fisherman. But I've never been an inspector, but I've been inspected a thousand times. And I would say to the inspectors, which was one of these bosses, and say, you know, I was giving shit, they said, you know, when one of you guys come on board, we will know if we can walk around you by the way you walk on deck. How can you regulate what you don't understand? So he looked at me and says, uh, uh, yeah, and what are you doing about it to change it? So I thought, okay, uh, well, you know, would you give me a job? And I said, yeah, I give you a job. So for me, it's like playing rugby. You know, you play for the blues, you play for the red, but it's still rugby. So my take is I really enjoy what I'm doing now because I'm a person's person and I basically get paid to work in the Pacific. You know? So not now because I can't go, but you know, so the training, I, the other thing is, I would say, is fishing is not about fish. Fishing is about people. So if you care about people, that gives you a massive advantage. Because at the end of the day, as you saw on that, on that slide, yeah, uh, each sort of 15 years ago, when I was first went to Tokelau, there was one small uh, infirmary. Now there are three hospitals in each of the atolls. And those were paid from fishing. So, yes, we have an impact. Yes, people depend on it for living. And I like what uh, Herb says, it's a sliding and you're not gonna get it right on the first time. Yeah. But yeah, I would say what I do like now is like, like the most, if I could travel again, of course. Thank you very much. So we give him a round yeah. of applause. Thank you. Oh.
Okay. Our last speaker is um, Carolyn Lundquist, and she moved to New Zealand in 2000 after obtaining her PhD in ecology at the University of California. Um, Davis and a bachelor in science in marine biology from the University of Los Angeles. Is that right? UCLA. UCLA, sorry. <laughs> Uh, she holds the joint position as Principal Scientist Marine Ecology at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, NIWA, in Hamilton, and as an Associate Professor at the School of Environment at the University of Auckland. Her research interests are diverse, range, ranging from scientific research to informed management of mangroves and other coastal wetland habitats, to reviewing impacts of climate change on, seafood, on the seafood sector, to development of marine spatial planning tools, to improve management of cumulative impacts in New Zealand's ocean ecosystem and the development of global biodiversity scenarios. Her talk today is titled, Are our fisheries resilient to change? And can we please welcome Caroline Lundquist. Yeah, we're, we're allowed to eat in here, so we'll So we're not going to go out and talk and come back, because nobody will come back. I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> I'll try to be fast. Um, I do talk fast. Um, I know I recognize heaps of faces in the audience, so most of you have probably seen me at some point in time teaching in um, undergraduate or graduate courses, and many of you are seeing more of me for the next week. I teach a kind of marine spatial planning bit in the Marine 703 um, PGDIP class. Anyway, um, this will be a completely different part of me. So in my new life, I do a whole bunch of different things. And in fisheries world, um, I'm an ecologist. However, I somewhere in there got to lead a large fisheries climate change project that just culminated in July or June this year. And so, sorry, I'm supposed to share your screen. I didn't do that properly. Oh. Sorry for the interruption. Da, da, da. Yeah. Take so no one can, no one else can see it. Just <laughs> us. Just us. It's How would I ever know? Very exclusive. <laughs> but anyway, we had this large project which five years or six years ago maybe when it started it was actually quite novel for fisheries in New Zealand to have to think about climate change and I think uh, Matt commented on climate change now kind of sort of being like the one other stressor that's sometimes brought into stock assessments of the 20 odd that are done every year of which like five actually have real data in them I think those were some of his numbers what are we doing now oh no um still talking. But anyway, we had this project which was basically figure out what we actually know out there about fisheries and climate change. And so I figured I could talk about that today. And other people who know me, you'll have seen me. I always put pictures of my uh, kids because they are the future. And they kind of each fish-ish because that one used to be anaphylactically reacting to fish. So that was really sad for much of our lives. Anyway, put the acknowledgements up front. There are heaps of people that have contributed to this. And I think Francisco talked a moment ago about having cool, easily understandable graphics. I'll show you some of those. But first we start with, here's this giant beast. It's 150 pages or 153 pages long. I think it went through three different iterations because every time we would finish writing it, then it would sit in the wonderful world of MPI for about a year before it actually got published. And then so many new programs had just finished data that we were said, can you please rewrite that and add more? So um, we were really thrilled to see this get kicked under a carpet that we never have to see it again. Just kidding. Uh, but it did come out just a couple months ago and we had a big workshop that Matt and I and Vonda all presented at. Um, Matt that you've seen and Vonda Cummings was also the co-lead of this project. Uh, so anybody who cares, you can read that. Or someday in there, the second part of this, we have the 12 page simple version that I call the ones for my mother to read. Um, what do we actually know about fisheries impacts? Uh, what is uh, climate change going to do? And basically in this giant beast of a report, we reviewed anything and everything we could find. And then we pulled out information specific to about 30 fisheries. So 30 of those major fish stocks of what we could find on them. And so in there you have 
things on temperature. What do we know about temperature? I'm sure you've all seen pretty maps with nasty red stuff that implies things are gonna get a hell of a lot warmer. Um, but what does that actually mean for fisheries? We've also had heat waves. People have heard of heat waves, right? Now, why are heat waves important? Well, for some fish stocks, it means the fish go deeper. And we were, um, I think Matt was there as well. We had a fishery workshop in um, Australia probably about five years ago. And one of the worries with one of their fish stocks off Tasmania was with uh, warmer water, the fish would go deeper, but deeper water was outside of the EEZ, which meant they could no longer fish the fish because of temperature. So there are a whole bunch of things, not just what everybody thinks of things moving north or south with changes in temperature, but you also have those depth changes or fish might move outside of the depth that's actually fishable um, easily. So a whole bunch of other issues that really come out when you really look into it. Um, most of this is pretty obvious, but then um, even in things like snapper, if you're catching snapper in Otago Harbor, is there a quota for snapper in Otago Harbor? If there isn't, how do you start quota for snapper in Otago Harbor? Who gets access to that quota? Is it the local EV who don't current, do they have treaty rights to that? Is it the current snapper owners? So how do we actually change quota with climate change as our stocks move to different places? Uh, so a whole bunch of cool things not necessarily good things that are going on with temperature. And then of course, those changes in habitats, what happens if we lose our kelp forests? What happens if we lose our deep sea corals? Other things that uh, fish or often juvenile fish are associated with. Ocean currents and circulation. The short of it is nobody really knows what's going to happen there. Um, it's a big challenge and there's a lot of research being done there. There's a project called the Moana Project that um, I'm a research on that's led out of Met Service or Met Ocean, which is part of Met Service. They're out in Raglan, so a whole bunch of oceanographic modelers. But one of the kind of really interesting things is, so if you know where the Chatham Rise is, you see nice, awesome bits. I don't, you can't see the pointer probably, but cool places of high productivity. You'd expect that. That's where our major fisheries are in New Zealand. But what happens if ocean currents change where that is, and if moves slightly to the north, slightly to the south, and then the currents are no longer coinciding with that big Chatham rise feature that's at depths that we can fish. So lots of big unknowns there with ocean currents and circulation. Um, productivity, there's been quite a bit more work on that uh, particularly MPI has funded in the last three or four years since we started this review project. So this was one of the big things that we had to add in is like, oh, well, we've done all this research now. So write a new 20 pages on this report. And you're going, uh. um, but anyway, we have um, expected compared to the rest of the world, we're probably not going to do that bad in New Zealand in terms of changes in productivity. But it is something that we do need to know about because that ocean surface productivity then has all that material that transports to the deeper ocean and funds things like our hooky um, and the things that hooky eat. Uh, coastal erosion, this is probably why I got to lead this project because we do quite a lot of work on coastal sediments and sediment impacts. Uh, so one of the things that happens with climate change is we're getting more severe storm or fewer uh, amounts of rainfall and storms, but in more severe storms. So if you're, instead of having 20 small storms, you have five big ones and the big ones wash more sediment down and you've got more bacteria and other things coming in there. And we get a lot more sediment smothering. So some cool pictures of sediment coming in and drowning stuff. That's a big problem in our coasts and estuaries for in particular the habitat that animals are often, our fish are often associated with. What else do I have? Of course, OA, so this is just an easy plot. Uh, CO2 goes up, pH goes down. These are numbers from New Zealand. And then we also have one of the things associated that in deep water, we have this aragonite saturation depth. So basically in deep colder water, things are actually even more susceptible to starting to dissolve because pH goes down. That's the simple explanation of it. Don't ask me to do the chemistry. I've had to before. It's really embarrassing because it's like writing on equations on a chalkboard in front of a classroom. You learn, you can't add anymore when you're in front of people trying to do deep maths. Anyway, um, important for our deep sea corals in particular, if we're having this decline, we know where the problems are going to be. When we're doing marine spatial planning, this actually changes where your 
priority locations are for marine protected areas on the Chatham Rocks. So it is that big of an important thing to consider those future stressors on deep sea corals. Deep sea corals, why are they important? Uh, in particular, orange ruffy like to hang out with them. So for fisheries, they are a big deal. Um, but in general, we've got research, probably good research on four or five species in New Zealand. That would be green lip mussels, pala, snapper, kingfish, and kinna that we probably have good information on ocean acidification and everything else we know F all. Um, I'm trying not to swear. Um, we'll see if it works. Um, and then this, these are just some other bits, particularly important for shellfish aquaculture. If we're looking at shell strength of our power and our greenlet mussels, we need to know what's going on there. But you know, 10 years ago, we really didn't even know what the long-term progression was, what the natural variability was in um, pH in the coast. So there's a whole heap of information that we have now that we really didn't 10 years ago in New Zealand. Um, so put it all together, put a, get a giant plot like that. So we've, we've got about 30 species there. And what you really need to look at is white has a question mark. That means we have no clue. And so we've got a whole pile of stuff where we have environmental variables. So what's going to happen with that species with changes or increasing temperature, changes in pH, et cetera. And the vast majority for most of our species in New Zealand outside of temperature, we have no idea. That's a bit disturbing. It should be quite disturbing for what is the potential resilience of our fisheries to climate change. And then on the other hand, if we take this second column, these are all our biological parameters. So what's going to happen in terms of different kind of mortality or recruitment or other specific biological parameters of the fisheries? And most of these were a bit better at saying, OK, well, a yes, that kind of orangey one is, yes, someone's actually studied that. Oysters, mussels, pala, rock lobster, snapper, little bit of hokey but we don't do a lot of research on a lot of things. On the other hand, we have this giant gold blob of, we're pretty sure if someone actually did study this based on knowing other species that are like this, that it's actually gonna be a big problem. And that's a bit concerning where we have a lot of, we have no idea, but then we have an equal number of, we're pretty sure it's gonna be a problem based on knowing what's going on in the rest of the world. So, um, what we did then was instead of being able to say, we know exactly what's going on fisheries New Zealand with all of these species, we went, oh crap. Well, how about we know three species well enough that we think we could actually do some type of assessment of what's going on and help you develop some adaptation strategies. So we basically took that whole of ecosystem approach. So not just looking at specific stock things, but also the ecosystem that they're associated with and we made these cute little tools that um, we worked with some friends of mine from grad school, I always hang out with your buddies from grad school because you might need them later on, but a, um, but a couple that um, they work at EcoAdapt in the States, they're an NGO that does climate change adaptation. And so when the contract came up, I'm like, can you guys help please? Uh, and they said, sure. And then what we did was we took this ugly thing, we picked our three beasties that we knew the most about, making sure we were picking something shellfish, something inshore, something offshore, so that we could please all of the different major fishing interests. And then we basically developed this tool where we use the industry as well as the managers, as well as the scientists. So we basically had huge buy-in, for example, from the Powell Industry Council. We probably had three or four workshops for each of these. A lot of them were over Zoom before the days when people used Zoom because um, this was quite a few years, well, maybe about three years ago that we were doing most of these. And then we had kind of two big bits of the tools. The first one is actually getting all the people in the room that actually know about the fishery. It's not just the scientists. The fishers typically know just as much, if not often quite a lot more than the scientists do about fish. So getting what do we actually think is best available knowledge on what's gonna happen based on all of these different drivers. Is it gonna be good? Is it going to be bad? And then taking what those drivers are and coming up with, well, what are our strategies to make sure that this fishery doesn't crash? So how can we actually be proactive and pick what we call things that are avoiding uh, conservation cul-de-sacs is what our, our friends Laura and Eric called them. And they use the example of one of the fisheries that they worked on in um, 
Puget Sound where they work in Washington State. And the challenge with that particular fishery is they get all of their brood stock from Hawaii. That's a cul-de-sac if you're stuck with one thing. And we'd give an example of greenlit mussels. Where do we get greenlit mussel spat, anyone? Yeah, 90 mile beach. So an entire aquaculture organization is dependent, or fish or aquaculture uh, species is dependent on one beach and nobody actually knows where the spat on 90 mile beach comes from. Uh, uh, anyway, so making sure that we're aware how the system works and come up with some adaptation strategies. And then we did this for Pella. And so we have the really ugly, as with everything, we have the ugly, huge, massive data intensive version of everything. When we have data, we've then defined it, whether it's actually robust data that someone's actually collected, or if it's information somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who worked on a similar species. Uh, and then is it something that was done in New Zealand or overseas? So we basically have that kind of track record of where all the information came from on here. And then in our other infographic version, so the kind that you give to your MP or to your fisheries minister that he can read and understand, we have this simple, simple and stupid version, not stupid, but what are the key problems that we have for this particular fishery? So for Pala, not a surprise, temperature, ocean acidification, uh, things that impact on the coast. So our storms and coastal sedimentation, things that impact on kelp habitats where they live. You know, most of us could have said that probably beforehand, none of it's terribly surprising, but putting it all down and then going, what do we have to do to protect against all of those things to make sure our fishery is, I hate that word sustainable, but available to us to catch things and make money off of them for the longer term. And you end up having a whole bunch of slightly different strategies than you might think like, okay, if we're starting to lose our juvenile power because they're starting to have shell issues, can we find resilient families as broodstock that we can use that are, have stronger shells? people are working on this now. Can we make sure that we've got hatchery-based rearing and outplanting? Can we figure out how to outplant different life stages? So coming up with a whole bunch of actually very different things than what we normally look at in fisheries management, which is primarily around adjusting tack, you've heard far too much about that, and stock assessments. Um, so this is the ecologist slash social scientist getting a handle on it, but everybody actually loved it, so it was good. Um, so here's just snapper again, snapper, same thing, and those look like little wormy parasites to everyone, I hope. Um, yeah, that's my guess. But one of the big issues that is likely to happen with snapper is with increasing temperature, we may have increasing diseases and, um, and parasites. So how do we actually create the monitoring that we don't have now that actually looks at that parasite and disease problem? So identifying these things in advance so that then in the adaptation strategies, we're actually monitoring to see if those things are a problem so that we can address them if they do become a problem. So again, very different than just doing stock assessments. On the other hand, a lot was pointed out where our stock assessments don't really include climate change at all. Sometimes occasionally as a, oh, let's run different environmental scenarios, but typically we don't include climate change in scenarios either. So making sure that's in there. Uh, and Hokey, and I think Hokey was probably the biggest surprise for me because you'll see this, this is our little band. If it's in red, that's bad. If it's over here in yellow, it's not. And I'd heard all about heat waves and how the hokey stock was disappearing. And um, generally everybody thinks from the industry, from the managers, et cetera, think it's actually doing okay and uh, reasonably robust, but big pushes for better information. So Matt would have mentioned how little information we have that actually feeds into revising our stock assessments, how much it costs, what is it, 3 million bucks to take Tongaro out to do a month long survey. So how do we actually get better information so that our stock assessments we know are robust and um, uh, particularly good to fit for purpose for what we need them for. Um, so not a surprise. We know that there are things going on with climate change, but we don't have a lot of information. And then trying to peel it down where we actually sat a whole bunch of people in the room, the idea is we've done three fisheries and hopefully Fisheries New Zealand will take that on and do that across a whole bunch of other fisheries with um, also taking into account some of the comments 
I think this was in the Q&A session, but you know, one of Matt's ideas is you can't just do one fishery at a time. Why are we not treating hokey, hake, and ling as one fishery? Because they're all caught together. You know, you don't catch just hokey, you might catch the other two. And when you run out of quota for hokey, you stop fishing for hake and ling because you can't catch them because you might catch hokey and you've already run out. So we need to actually be doing more kind of proactive and more kind of not habitat, but community-based uh, stock assessments. Um, anyway, I have just a couple more left and everybody can eat, but the big picture for me is I work on marine spatial planning and about 3 billion other things because I haven't decided what I want to do when I grow up either. Um, but the ocean is a multi-user space. It's not just fisheries. We need to do more things. I managed more things and not just manage fisheries separate from everything else. We need to have a fisheries pro, um, plan that is for 500 years and a couple of our major fishing companies in New Zealand, I think it's Moana, this the one that has a 500 year plan. A lot of our iwi have 500 year plans. They want everything to be there in five years. We're not trying to maximize profit today. Uh, and then I think my last point is sustainability has come up. Sustainability could mean you're only catching 10 fish a day. That's still sustainable in some economic terms because they're only 10 fish and you're still catching 10 every day. But that doesn't actually mean it's a, an abundant, flourishing, healthy fish stock. So changing our definition of sustainability so that it's not about economics and it's not about fisheries, but it's actually a healthy ecosystem that is sustainable. Um, and there are a couple little things out there. If anybody wants to read this, there's some cool climate fishery scenarios that Aotearoa Circle put out. And then this is just, I think I've got one of Tamlin slides. One of my PhD students is doing some work on, can we have our fish and eat them too? And then Bloody New Zealand Geographic stole his title of one of his chapters, so he's a bit bummed. Um, but basically, can we actually, within a spatial planning thing, can we actually put together fisheries and ecosystems um, and come up with balanced solutions that actually protect all of that. And so um, hopefully you can still see Tamlin's name coming out, whoever's taking picture, um, but pretty cool stuff that we're doing both at the, uh, within Tamlin's thesis, both at that uh, global scale, as well as just starting to work on this at the national scale. And then in some other work we do in IPIS, what do we imagine our ocean future is going to be like? It could be this image of nature for nature. This is cutting off a lot of the world to fishing. Is that what we want? Or do we want something where we actually have fishing going on alongside other uses of the environment? And this includes a lot of things that we actually do quite well in New Zealand, like our um, coastal matai tai, rahui, taiapare, uh, so different customary management tools. So how do we actually bring together those diversity of values that we have for the ocean and what's in it? And I think I just have cool pictures of oceans at the end. So that's it, time to eat. Thank you, Carolyn. Do we have a question? Or oh, everyone's too hungry that they don't want to think. Yes, okay. We'll, we'll thank everyone for joining the, um, the speaker night tonight. Thank you very much for staying with us. We have some pizza for you. And everyone that was online, thank you as well for joining. And um, we'll see you on another opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying, those of you other than